<laughs> so let's let's attack traditions. No, I'm just kidding. Is that <laughs> We're talking. Uh, we're talking the week of keys, transfiguration, uh, healing the paralytic, all those things. Um, I am so like okay. Uh, I I am like flying at forty thousand feet with some of this stuff right now, and so uh, I just I, I have to constantly remind myself this is interesting to me, but it's probably not super relevant to everybody else. That's usually where I get with some of this stuff, right? Which aspect? Uh, like specifically the keys and the transfiguration part of it, right? Like I see those stories as so interconnected. Um, to, to be honest, the idea of, uh, you know, when Jesus kind of goes after the Pharisees and I can't remember who I was talking to. Oh, um, <laughs> Shad, our brother Shad was was uh, he, he was talking to his buddy and his buddy was actually teaching a class and actually said the word pharisaical as kind of a derogatory, you know, you know, an, an overemphasis right. on keeping with the law. But there was actually um, a Jewish scholar in that group and he actually yeah. came up and said, uh, that was really offensive what you said. And he's like, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you were disparaging <laughs> a, a tradition that we actually credit with keeping the Jewish kind of diaspora all together after all of these like crazy, uh, you know, geopolitical collapses. And, and he's like, yeah. if it wasn't for the Pharisees, we would have lost our identity, our understanding of self, and you're using it as a derogatory <laughs> term. And I'm like, wow, man, I probably am guilty of that. So I don't, I don't know how That's I true. feel about the approach. So you, <clears throat> what do you guys think? What, what do we do with that first lesson about traditions and whatnot? Where, where do you go with that? Well, let me, let me read this first thing <clears throat> that the, the curriculum says. It says, beware that traditions can be a sensitive topic. <laughs> Some students may have strong feelings about holding on to tradition. So pray for help to teach the concept through the spirit. Heavenly father can provide guidance to help students feel safe as they evaluate their traditions within the context of gospel standards. So I, there, there is, there is a, you know, especially if we're talking to, to some early morning teachers here or, or anybody that's going to teach, there is, there is a caution to be sensitive Traditions are traditions for a reason, right? They they are meaningful exercise of thought and community, and like there's a reason that it exists. Right. And I think I think we get we get really <laughs> maybe maybe a little tongue in cheek when we start quoting Book of Mormon, you know, the evil traditions of their fathers, and we kind of we we just throw that around pretty haphazardly. But but I think I think if you were to look at it the way that the Savior does look at it. That if the tradition, if the tradition becomes a law unto itself, then then we have a problem. But yeah. there's nothing wrong with tradition per se, right? We have traditions around Christmas, we have traditions around birthdays, we have even teachers have traditions in their classrooms. Right. And so it's just a matter right. of it's just it's just a matter of looking at what the savior is saying about how traditions, if they become so perfect example would be. The, the tradition of, of, of grooming and appearance in the church, right? We, we have this, um, you're saying this cause I have a beard today. Is that why you're saying? I'm, this? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking completely different things, but you should repent. <laughs> it's feeling aggressed, <laughs> but, but let's just, let's just, let's just put in some proper context here. What is the, what's the general attitude that, that long time members of the church might have towards a, a an adult male, um, who holds the Melchizedek priesthood wearing a non-white dress shirt to sacrament? Wow. Yeah, right. Or or having or having non-traditional uh, hairstyle or yeah. I mean, we have a bishop in our state that has just the gnarliest lumberjack beard, and I've had I've had other members of state pres like other stakes come up to me and say, "Do you really have a bishop in your stake with a beard?" And I was like, "Well, yeah." And he's like. You have four. I, I remember seeing four of them with beards. And his, by the <laughs> way, is glorious. And oh, his <laughs> is like if you want to talk about somebody that, that you could have beard envy for, that I have beard envy when I see Bishop D's. But but the point is, 
if if the tradition overrides um like why does anybody ever stop to ask Bishop D's why why he wears a beard? Does anybody has anybody asked him how much more relatable he is to his congregation by the fact that he has a beard in, in that particular community and 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 the youth are are much more um much more likely to uh to to approach him. Um did did you hear Shad tell the story about the the institute teacher that's got a beard up in Colorado? Oh yeah, I read I read his thing. Yeah, you read read his thing, and, yeah, and his his data is interesting. His data shows that he's relatable. Yeah, Mason, you're going to jump in. What were you going to say? Um, I think I was just going to say I think traditions are valuable. In fact, I think the the traditions of the Pharisees are valuable. Um, it and I, I taught the parable of the prodigal son last night. So Jesus is getting challenged by Pharisees, right? And so he, he, in Luke 15, he tells three parables about God seeking after his lost sheep, a lost, lost coin, lost son, right? And and in each of those, well, particularly in the parable of the prodigal son, there's a there's a, a role that the Pharisees are are meant to identify with uh, of the elder son. And, uh, and when you're going through that parable, Jesus, Jesus's words here to the Pharisees in, in Matthew 15 can be pretty abrupt, right. but his words in Luke 15, if the Pharisees are to think of themselves as the prodigal or as the older son, who's faithful, they're incredibly empathetic. Um, and, and, you know, I think the Pharisees, we can assume that most of the Pharisees are operating in good faith. They, they long for the redemption of their people who have been oppressed for centuries. And they think that the way to do that is to fulfill their end of the covenant. Um, and in order to ensure the righteousness of the people, they build fence laws, right? Mm -hmm. Tradition has built fence laws around the covenant so that, it's not you never get close enough to actually breaking the commandment to even flirt with breaking the commandment we do that all the time in the church yeah we do that's what the entire for the strength of youth pamphlet was before they changed it was was these <clears throat> non-commandment standards that <clears throat> are wise to keep because it means that you never get close enough to actually break the commandment mm -hmm. i think if we pay close attention to what jesus is saying here in, in matthew 15 is particularly his quote of isaiah it really gets to the heart and i'm going to read it out of the new revised standard version because i think it because this isaiah quote is going to be familiar to us through the restoration it's helpful to hear it in a different way he says this people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me in vain do they worship me teaching human precepts as doctrines. And that last bit, I think, is, is the point yeah. um, that, that tradition is incredibly valuable, but tradition isn't a relationship with Christ. And, and oftentimes um, in, in the church, we can be guilty of presenting the tradition as the savior. Uh, we can even be guilty of presenting the commandments as the savior. Sometimes we teach repentance as if it's the first principle of the gospel. Yeah. And it's not faith in Jesus Christ is the first principle of the gospel. And it's that faith in Jesus Christ that enables and empowers repentance. Um, and so <clears throat> there's an easy way, I think, to affirm the wise teachings of people's parents and grandparents and and leaders of the church, um, but also to make the distinction, look, these, there's wisdom in how we live, and that can be reaffirmed by tradition, but then there's Jesus and our relationship to him, and those two things are different, and, and, if, and if they're out of order, um, if, one, if tradition comes before Jesus, if it gets in the way and doesn't point us to him, then, then it's, then it's on the chopping block. Yeah. Right. Then it needs yeah. to go. So I, I think it's another opportunity to help 
and, and I think our students will respond positively to this. A yeah. lot of the rejection of religion in the world is a rejection of tradition, not a rejection of a desire to be saved or a desire to be healed from our wounds or anything. So the more we focus on the Lord here and, and help, um, I used to tell my institute class in ASU, you know, when we remove Jesus from the center of the church, things get weird, right? The church can get really weird really quick if Christ isn't right there in the center. So this is, I mean, every, every lesson is an opportunity to do this, but, but here's a really pragmatic way. Let's think about the traditions in the church. Let's think about the traditions in your family. How do we help focus them on the Lord? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> this is uh, this is, I think if we look at what happened in general conference just recently, um, you, you, you can see prophets and prophets and seers, uh, kind of addressing a lot of this, <clears throat> where when we get we get weird about some of the things that we hold clear or hold dear to our hearts, but when we've divorced it from Jesus, it it no longer is like you said. It's on the chopping block. It, that's something to be removed, right? I mean, I even that, even the temple endowment, right? It, <clears throat> I don't want to be irreverent and say, well, that was on the chopping block too, but. There were valuable things that were part of the temple endowment that are no longer a part of the temple endowment. Right. Because they needed to be cleared away to give us even more focus. On right. That's a really good example. Right. Yeah. Really good. Ryan, so, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say it's a, it's a natural progression. Um, this idea of making sure that we're looking at the principles the right way to the really the kind of the next big part of this of this particular block of scripture which is which is the declaration of peter um it's it's almost as if the savior goes to caesarea philippi which is not nearby anything it is it is quite the the trek north out of judea out of galilee it's kind of in its its own kind of place alone and and i don't know if i don't know if chronologically where this fits with the bread of life sermon but you know, if you've got a if you got a whole mass of disciples that are no longer following, but you got your core group, and this is this is the core group that's gonna, you know, Christ is we're we're definitely on the on the other side of 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 his peak of popularity where it's gonna end at the cross. Like this core group needs to have this very principle, and whether you know whether we get it here at the at the 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 doctor mastery or even in the next chapter with the Mount of Transfiguration, it is clear that the Savior needs them to know exactly who he is if they're going to go out and yeah. preach. Right? Yeah. I mean we get that in, in Matthew 16 verses 5 through 12 where the, where Jesus is saying beware of the yeast, right? Of the, the leaven of the of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the disciples, that core group, not the disciples, 5,000 of them, that core group is like, oh, it's, he's, he's talking about us forgetting to bring bread, mm -hmm. right? And and it's that principle that Jesus is like, you still think this is about bread? <laughs> <laughs> focus, right? Focus on me, focus on, and, and it's, yeah, even, even the disciples, still can't quite see him clearly um and there's a moment here in in this block of scriptures where they do get to see him clearly right well and that's that's the masterful part of his questions right it's almost it's almost like sitting around the campfire and just after the after you know do you think this is still about bread maybe looking at him and going who do you who do you think i am yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they some say you're a prophet or some say you're no 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 that's not what I'm asking. Who do you, the ones I have chosen, who do you think that I am? And and I wonder how quiet it was and for how long before Peter finally you're you're the Christ. Right? And and, and maybe light bulbs are starting to turn on for the other uh, the other apostles but but there is there is a moment and and the savior acknowledges this. There's a moment that the spirit is finally like penetrating whatever if we want to call it traditions because the the whole the whole leaven of the pharisees is <clears throat> we need to break through the fence let's get to the heart of what this is the spirit's finally penetrated that 
who who am I really? And once they once they're able to acknowledge that part of it, then the teachings about this is how we're going to build the church. I'm going away. The whole rock of this is your ability to bear testimony of who I really am. Because if you're just saying I'm a prophet or I'm some Elias that came back, um, it's not gonna it's it's not gonna work. You got to yeah. You got to penetrate that to get to the to the bedrock of who I am. Um, being the son of son of the living God. And that's, that's how this is going to build up from, from, from the base level. Yeah, that's good. So if we were to, so here, here's here, if I were to connect 16 to 17, um, I, I've been kind of considering this at a different, uh, as, as a connecting thing. Cause I, oftentimes, I don't know if, if you were, if, if you were guilty of this in the past teaching these, but uh, it's almost as if, we're going to do Matthew 16 and it's its own thing. You know, it's all about keys of the priesthood and it's revelation. And then 17 is its own thing. And here's the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount of Transfiguration and, and that's its own thing. I've been guilty of separating those two stories, but they are really close together and, and on purpose. Um, I've been kind of thinking through what is the connection between that experience on the Mount versus these keys and it's taking me down a journey. Let me just throw some stuff against the wall. You tell me if it sticks. Okay? <laughs> Wait, let me get my shotgun. All right. Are you ready? Cool. So, so like the word transfiguration has been talked about and it's, and we've got some pretty kind of like loosey goosey kind of definitions of what this is. Mormon doctrine's got some information. Bible dictionary's got some information. I think we can all settle on the fact that we have experiences in the scripture where people needed to be changed to be in God's presence. Is that, is that general basic enough on the understanding of transfiguration? Check. M Moses came down from the mountain, having been transfigured, his face is shining right here at the Mount. Um, you got the three Nephites in the book of Mormon. Um, uh, even, Joseph, even Joseph Smith, yeah, yeah, Joseph person. Smith and 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 uh, Oliver or Sidney, for example, when they're receiving DNC seventy six, right? So th they had to have this moment of change in order to be in God's presence. It's it's interesting though. Were Adam and Eve transfigured? When are you talking? In the garden. Well, they're they're in a different condition. They're in a different place. Okay. Point, right? so, so we have a different condition there when they fall we're in the fallen world then we need to be elevated at a different state it seems to me that when we start talking about keys of the priesthood uh, uh jesus is even saying here i'm going to give you these keys and then he almost demonstrates what the keys do he unlocks for peter james and john their ability to actually come up a mountain and be in his presence and they hear the voice of the father they have these other beings there jesus is right there shining in his glory and he's very sinai right yeah and he uses the keys to give them access to this thing and i'm looking at it going man he's he's even invoking binding and loosing and and when we go into the temple and we experience priesthood keys unlocking for us the endowment ceremony is this moving from one state to the next state to the next state until we enter into God's presence, and it's 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 pretty transformative. Um, there comes a time, and I'm going to link this to the second coming. Again, I'm throwing crap against the wall. You tell me if it's fitting. When Jesus comes, the you know the final time when all see him, right? Um, you know, Christianity would call it you know the um, the rapture, the rapture, where you know. Only the righteous will be raised up. Everybody else will burn <clears throat> stubble. Um, it seems like there's going to come a time where Jesus is going to show up and he's not going to transfigure. He's, he's going to show up. And those who have already, through his grace, through his power, through priesthood keys, through access to ordinances, to making covenants, we will have already achieved a level where we can be in his presence. Meaning the Mount of Transfiguration is a temple ceremony. And we've heard people say that. <laughs> but it is something that we're supposed to be working towards. Because in, in DNC 88, we learned that 
uh, or, or even in DNC 103 and 105, and when, when they're talking about why Zion wasn't established, it's because they weren't living the higher laws. Uh, we, we can actually qualify for the presence as we do yeah. what we need to do, as priesthood keys are unlocking the door, as we are actually gaining access to God's presence. Transfiguration won't be necessary. We, we will have gotten there. Okay, now, I've thrown it all against the wall. <laughs> you want us to sort it out now? Mason, go. I think I'll just say, yeah, I think I'll just say, like, we talk about the temple, even like in, in more recent changes, the word symbolic, right, comes up a lot with the temple. And, <clears throat> and I think we sometimes mistake that to mean not real. Right. Like we're just playing at it. Um, and we let that we let some power go out of the experience because it's symbolic. Um, symbols, symbols are the way that we have real experiences in this life. We're, we're communicating right now through symbols and you can have and we're genuinely together. I mean, we're, we're on Zoom or whatever, but we're having real conversations right now. Words are symbols. Uh, <clears throat> this ring is symbolic it's not magic when i put this ring on i don't magically become married to my wife but it is a true reminder and it is evidence of of our relationship and all these things so i would say that when we're talking about our symbolic worship in the temple we're not talking about something that's not real um it's it's not just uh, going through a series of symbols. We truly are being given the, the way to walk in order to come into the presence of God. It's explicitly told us, this is how you enter into the presence of God. And in recent years, there's been uh, movements within the church, kind of fringe movements within the church that have become overly obsessed with entering the presence of God and doing it in some type of strange way um and uh and re even recently a member of my stake came up and said i think i feel like i need to give you this book and it was a book that was this is how you right. receive your second anointing or whatever right it's it is through the keys of the priesthood right uh and, and that connection that you're making i think is really important i also think it's really important here in the mount of transfiguration jesus is you know who do you who do people say that i am well you're one of the prophets who do you say that i am i'm the messiah okay do you see the difference now yeah, yeah. right even moses and elijah the two great prophets of the jewish tradition the lawgiver and the miracle worker of the jewish tradition right like even they come and witness to me even the father witnesses of me um and so yeah i think this genuine high mountain experience that we're talking about um when we go through the temple we are genuinely being trained on how to commune with the heavenly host commune with those on the other side of the veil receive the ministering of angels and qualify uh to enter into the, that presence absolutely I, I feel like i feel like we almost we almost approach these experiences as things that will take place when we die yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. judgment. Like, like I, 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 again, I've been guilty of considering the moment going into the presence of God as that moment of judgment and uh, <clears throat> maybe, but, but it does seem like there is much more the, the process and the path is something that takes place, uh, can take place at any time on this journey as we it does as, as keys are unlocked as as we move forward we we are able to just be with them and it's not death it's not judgment ryan what were you gonna say well, i was just i was just gonna say another another interesting connection in, in matthew 16 he says i will give you the keys of the kingdom right so that's a future thing and right. so the, the curriculum i i guess i'd Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I just kind of like uh, subconsciously uh, may, may knew this, but but they're pretty implicit in 
and comparing side by side um, mount of transfiguration with DNC 110 and DNC 110 with the, those visitations and just, all right, so it's not coincidence that the, because, because in, in Matthew 17, it, it does tell us that, you know, they, they do understand that John the Baptist is one of those that that's there. Right. And, and Elijah, it, it's probably mo most likely that it's Moses and Elijah and it's John the Baptist, right? It could be all three of them. Right. Um, but if you if you read one ten with with the Mount of Transfiguration in mind, what is it that they're receiving there? Well, they're literally receiving those keys. There's there's probably a hands on head kind of a moment that's taking place. Why Peter, James, and John, and not all of the twelve? Um, why Joseph and Oliver and not the twelve? Because the twelve are established <clears throat> at this point, right? Um, and then, and then what is, and then what does section 88 teach us about these keys? Well, it's through the keys of, of the, uh, of the Melchizedek priesthood that the, the power of the, the power of godliness is manifest, right? We're going to learn about who God is. And I think, I think what you're saying is, is spot on, right? The purpose for temple worship and why, why president Nelson's been hammering on this. Um, I may or may not have shared this with you guys, but I, I used the, uh, I use the search function in the the uh, um, general conference corpus um, database, and mm. just I just did a search under the word power. Um, and President Nelson has used that word at least previous to this last conference. I haven't added it since. He's used the word power in the last five years, um, 115 times. Mm. Um, and and in his all in his entire ministry, it's been over 366 <clears throat> times. Something, something President Nelson understands about faith, um, about covenants, um, whatever, whatever temple, whatever, whatever topics he's kind of the, the power of, of receiving personal revelation, right? Uh, whatever, whatever the topic is, he understands that there is a power that is manifested as we strive to have more faith, repent daily, um, focus on Jesus Christ more honor our covenants and live the covenant path and, and go to the temple, making the temple a part of our spiritual foundation. Like he understands that all these are just little pieces that are eventually going to unlock the power of knowing who God is. Right. And, Wait, that, and that comes because priesthood keys have been administered so that these ordinances can be performed. Which is literally what every one of these experiences are is it's an endowment of power, <laughs> knowledge, that's what Moses experienced. Yeah. That's what that's what Peter and James and John are experiencing. The three Nephites. That's what they're experiencing as they see visions that they can't even utter. That's what J what's, that's all these things are an endowment of power and knowledge. Before the power the to do what? What's the power? Like it's not it's not Harry Potter. It's not superheroes. What's right. the power? Well, the mysteries of godliness, which were no, only. What's the power? The power, power simply, and especially in, in biblical um, literature, it's just movement, right? right? Angels, angels are, are are manifested with wings because that's 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 the symbol for their ability to move, and and we're given power to move, to progress, to to right. to, to continue up the mountain to the presence of God. Yeah, Mason. So I think <clears throat> I'm thinking as a you know, how do I make this relevant? Right. Or told you uh, I'm flying. We just nerded out, out didn't we? <laughs> yeah. And, and it's not, it's not unrelated to this conversation. I'm thinking of the experience of Peter, James, and John. Okay. They're up there. They literally don't know what to do. Right. They're yeah. just like, should we build some booths? Right. <laughs> Is this <laughs> and, Is the feast and, of uh, tackles might as well. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Peter, James, and John, they don't know this yet, but they're going to give priesthood keys too, right? In the same way that they're receiving keys, they're going to be angelic ministers to give keys. P Peter, James, and John, they don't know this yet, but they're going to be the, the symbols that the Savior uses to communicate the endowment, right, in the latter days, Um they probably didn't see themselves this way yet, right? So when they're sitting there and there's Moses and there's Elijah and there's Jesus, maybe there's John the Baptist and there's the voice of the Father. 
and they're sitting there going, it's kind of cool that we're is here. It, <laughs> is it good for us? It's good for us to be here, right? Like, but I know myself as Peter. I don't, you know, Peter who who misses his wife, Peter who uh, both testified of the Lord and then got rebuked by him right away, right? That Peter who's still stumbling along, um, I don't see myself as part of the heavenly host. Mm -hmm. and and But they get a glimpse of it. They start getting welcomed in. And, and that's, that's also there for us when we make these priesthood covenants, when we go to the temple and, and we're communing with the heavenly host because we're part of that team. Right. Uh, and, and in a similar way, we might not see ourselves, our students might not see themselves as, uh, as angelic ministers or as people who have been called and set apart and made covenants from before the foundation of the world to build the kingdom of God and, and to go find specific people on their missions or to bring specific spirits to the earth through families or to lead congregations or to lead churches, right? Like they might not see themselves that way, but, but when we, when, when we do do these ordinances, we're communing with the heavenly host on the other side of the veil and we're one people and um and we belong with them it is good for us to be there right. um, and then it is good for us to come down off the mountain and get to work again yep. um and that's the power that we're being that's given power, right? you know when when we make this all these covenants are building up in the temple we make the covenant to consecrate we're, we're making the covenant to say okay i'm taking these resources that i'm being given and now I'm going to go to work to, to gather Israel, to build the kingdom, to unite families. All. I'm going to do the work the, of the Messiah because I have the name of the Messiah on me now. I, I, I carry the name of Christ. I've been given that by a proper authority. And I've made covenants that help me to receive that name so that I can properly uh, minister in the name of Christ because I belong here uh, in this heavenly host. And we talk about, you know, conversion, relevancy, and belonging a lot in seminary. Um, a lot of our students will go to the temple, and if we're not careful in how we prepare them, and we're not helping them focus on Christ, they might not feel like they belong there. Right. Or they might not feel like they belong on missions or whatever it might be. Um, and I think one of the central messages here, you know, it always changes depending on which character you focus on the principle but if you're going to focus in on these disciples who have no idea what's going on right they've they've been lifted out of their everyday lives and and set in heaven and said okay can't tell anybody about this until you actually understand right what's happening um there's something in there and i don't know what it looks like in everybody's different classes but there's something in there to help students to think about their own, how they see themselves now versus who they really are, right? If they could see themselves before the foundations of this world. I, I had a guy on my mission whose patriarchal blessing told him that he was good friends with Joseph Smith before he came. And, and this, this missionary wasn't the most obedient missionary. And at one point, my mission president locked eyes with him and said this is how you represent your friend <laughs> right like <laughs> it, 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 and and that's a, that's a pretty hard thing to hear but he's trying to remind him look you're not just a 21 year old you're not just a 20 year old you're not just a kid you're way more than this and you got work to do here um and, and so i i think that's a really beautiful piece of this that we can connect through ordinances through the temple um and hopefully hopefully something sticks with them that they remember when they go through these experiences yeah it's good for us to be here yeah you know i like it all right for the sake of time i think our discussion needs in there but i think there's a lot there so have fun with it <laughs>